All right, guys. I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we've got Corey Rosenblum here to talk about tactics for success, and uh, specifically some of the things that he's laid out that he wants to, to discuss today include creating a game plan for the next trading day, assessing and adapting to the type of the day structure, matching tactics and execution to your risk tolerance and psychology, and assessing the broad narrative and higher time frame factors. Uh, for those of you that don't know Corey, he is an author and he is a CMT. Uh, we are going to be giving away five autographed copies of his book today. The book is called The Complete Trading Course, Price Pattern, Strategy, Setups, and Execution Tactics. So at the very end of the webinar, uh, what we're going to do is have a little quiz with five questions, and we will pick five winners uh, to answer those questions correctly to get the autographed copies of the book. Uh, the way we do that is I'm going to ask for your BMT username. If you came to the webinar from some other means and you're not already a uh, Big Mike Trading uh, user, then just go to BigMikeTrading.com and click the button that says uh, register. And it's free. And then that way you'll be ready to give me your username uh, if you are one of the five winners. And then uh, we'll get the autograph book. Uh, in your hands. Now, uh, before I turn things over to Corey, it's actually because of Mira's Futures that this webinar is possible to today. Today, sorry, I'm, I'm still a little sick, so I'm stuttering a little bit. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to turn things over to Bob at Mira's Futures. He's going to very briefly talk about the products and services available at Mira's. Uh, that'll take only a few minutes, and then we're going to turn things over to Corey for the bulk of the presentation. And uh, as you guys have questions for either Miris or for Corey, uh, you can type them into the, uh, the questions box on GoToWebinar, and we'll do our best to get everyone's questions answered. I also want to mention that, as always, this webinar is being recorded, and I will post it in the usual spot sometime tomorrow, which is on BMT, and then you click Webinars at the top of any page. So sometime uh, tomorrow, that'll be up there. All right, guys, give me one second, and I'll be turning things over to Bob. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. I really do appreciate the intro there. Um, just want to make sure that you guys can see the, the screen with the, the PowerPoint, so if you can type yeah. in a, a yes or a Y into the... Yeah, we've got audio and we can see it just fine. Yes. Um, wonderful. Thanks again, Mike. I, I, I want to thank Mike, as always, for um, allowing us to, to do a brief intro. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mirrors Futures and those of you who are you know, currently customers of Mirrors Futures, I'm just going to do a brief overview so that you can get to Corey's uh, presentation uh, and just introduce some of the, uh, the products and services, as Mike mentioned, that we offer. Uh, here at Miris. <clears throat> and bear with me, I'm, I'm also starting to come down with something. Um, one of the things that uh, is often questioned uh, when we work with uh, newer traders or, or people looking to open an account is um, who are all the parties that are involved in, in understanding the relationships between the different companies that become your trading solution. Um, there's a lot of names thrown at you, whether it's from a platform vendor, or a clearing firm, a brokerage firm, or a technology. And I just want to spend a, a second identifying uh, who these parties are. So first of all, as you can see on the left-hand side, the, the clearing firm is, uh, is really who your account is open with. Uh, the clearing firm is responsible for holding your account, your, your funds, uh, for your trading account in a segregated uh, account in your name. Uh, at a bank, and they make sure the trade's clear at the end of the day uh, and are settled properly. Uh, at the end of every day, month, and year, they'll provide the statements that you can use uh, to track the performance of your account, and for tax purposes as well, as we approach that season. Um, Mirrors Futures is, uh, is what's known as an introducing broker, and we're really the, the client-facing side. Uh, we're a customer of the clearing firm. Traders are a customer of Miris. We're responsible for 
with providing you with the tools that are necessary for you to execute your trading plan. Uh, whether that's the front end uh, software like NinjaTrader uh, or the back end technology uh, trading engine like Zenfire, we're going to provide you with the tools that are really the best for executing uh, your strategies into the markets. One of the things that Zenfire does uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of, uh, aside from you know market data and order execution, is that it's what we use in-house for risk management. Um, Miris, as an introducing broker, handles risk management, and that's not something that's done traditionally by an introducing broker, but Zenfire allows us to do that uh, very efficiently uh, for our customers. Lastly, again, uh, we work with uh, our customers to identify whether they're self-directed uh, or wanting to go through a managed type uh, program, what is going to suit your needs the best. If you haven't already, uh, you can register for a 30-day demo account of the Zenfire trading engine. Uh, a lot of you who are familiar with it will, you know, can attest to its speed and reliability. Uh, but we really feel like it's the best in the industry uh, in terms of uh, those two factors: uh, speed and reliability. Uh, it boasts an incredible uptime and uh, just really helps you understand what what's going on and the dynamics of the markets that you're you're trading and analyzing. Uh, so you can register on, on our site under the Open Account tab in the upper, upper right-hand corner. You can register to receive a username and password that can be used with any of these platforms. Uh, so even if you start with a multi-charts uh, demo, uh, you can use the same username and password with NinjaTrader as well and really test the platforms as, as well. Uh, some of the additional things that, that we provide outside of uh, self-directed accounts are uh, trade assist pro programs for both futures and uh, spot FX, uh, managed futures programs. This is something that we're really excited about for 2013. Uh, we have just hired a, a managed, uh, a director of managed futures, uh, Dwayne Paul, and he has uh, some incredible background into managed futures. So if you're interested in diversifying in the futures realm, um, and are interested in a program that you don't have to sit in front of and, and analyze the markets, you know, this is a great place to start uh, and it'll help you get exposure to the markets without necessarily have to, having to trade them yourself. Uh, we also offer uh, full service brokerage uh, in which you will identify a trading plan with a, a broker who can uh, execute on your behalf. Um, Available currently to all of our accounts is daily technical analysis from Trading Central. Uh, it gives you a brief snapshot of uh, the morning and the day uh, direct to your inbox covering six different markets. And we also have uh, access to additional information including uh, education from Corey uh, webinars and, and articles. Um, Another big initiative for 2013 is uh, Zenfire Hosting Solutions. Whether you're looking for dedicated co-location uh, or virtual machines, we are able to, uh, or you are able to run your systems uh, in a co-located environment directly with the Zenfire trading engine uh, to, to really enhance the speed and reliability that you wouldn't otherwise get at home. Um, just a, a brief side note, we're going to be coming back into uh, Mike's room uh, later on this month and highlighting uh, several of our other uh, products and services that are coming up for 2013, so I do encourage you to register for that event when registration becomes available. Uh, just to recap here, um, Miris Futures, uh, we're known in the industry as uh, a leading uh, technology uh, provider, but we also focus on customer service. Uh, our support team uh, is knowledgeable, licensed uh, team that can assist you uh, through remote desktop support if necessary. Uh, we offer a lot of education online uh, for self-help. Uh, we also feature live weekly webinars uh, with quality educators such as Corey, uh, and uh, we do offer that, that free demo account. So if you have any questions, I'll stick around uh, throughout the webinar, um, but really the focus should be on Corey. Um, but I will be around to, to answer anything. 
if, uh, if you have questions for us, uh, whether it's about a demo account or any of the services or products that we offer, feel free to uh, reach out by phone or email. Uh, we'd be more than happy to speak with you. All right. Thanks, Bob. And uh, also, I want to mention that uh, both Miris Futures and Zenfire have won first place on uh, the BMT Best of Trading Awards for the last two years. So uh, I think that, and th you know, those people, the, the community is who votes for that. So I think that that speaks a lot to uh, how much people really appreciate Miris and Zenfire. I, see I appreciate a couple of, that mention. Sure. I see a couple of questions, and let's turn things over to Corey. So uh, Jeff wants to know if uh, Sierra Chart is supported with Miris. It's uh, it's a program uh, or a platform that you can use with your account and Zenfire. Uh, however, our technical support team is not um, is not trained on the platform. So, if you had questions about the functionality or issues with the functionality of the platform, support would all be handled by the uh, the platform itself. Um, okay. But you can use it with your account here. Okay. And you can and always a, a you can always use other... BMT for support too, because there's a lot of people that use uh, Sierra with Sunfire. It works. It works. Yeah, fine. there <laughs> there are, and there's also a number of other platforms uh, available as well, not just the ones that we uh, have on our website. Uh, Sunfire connects with you know over 12 different platforms, so feel free to get in touch with us, and we can run down the list. Right. Um, I'm trying to keep the questions very brief. Uh, do you guys uh, open accounts from Ontario? Um, check with us. There's uh, check with one of the brokers here. There is a, uh, a specific uh, regulation in Canada that prevents us from opening accounts in certain provinces of uh, Canada. Uh, I believe that um, Ontario is one that we do, but uh, okay. definitely call and speak with a broker and double check. Okay. And then some of the other questions are a little bit, little bit more advanced, and I want to give most of the time to Corey. So I'd like to, uh, for those guys to have other questions for Bob to just go ahead and send an email. It's info at mirrorsfutures.com, or you can call them numbers on the screen. All right. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Mike. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, to being back here later this month. Yeah. I'll see you. I think it's on the 29th. We'll have Mirrors back. All right, guys, give me one second, and I'll be turning things over to Corey. All right, Corey, we can see the, uh, the PowerPoint. Okay. Can you hear me? Make sure we can hear me. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you, and we can see it. Excellent. I'm going to make full screen, and we'll begin when you're ready. Uh, let's see. Full, yeah. Full yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. There it goes. Yep. Sounds good. Take Excellent. it. Take it away. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Bob, and everyone at Mirrors Futures and a Big Mike's Trading for allowing this opportunity. And this is going to be a tour de force to start 2013 um, because it's going to be really. I was talking with Mike earlier about trading principles for success or how to talk about in this new webinar. And I decided, uh, looking at four points, looking at execution tactics, day structure, things that really have helped me over the years to be a, a better trader. Uh, quantifying trades, putting them in, in a certain context, not just saying a flag is a flag or a head and shoulders is a head and shoulders or a breakout is a breakout, uh, taking them in isolation. For me, it's putting it into a context, putting it into a broader methodology, putting it in broader uh, concepts. And so we'll talk about that. But it was funny because I've actually given, I think, five presentations on uh, what we'll be talking about today. So the challenge for us is going to be finishing within an hour and getting the, the I'm excited about this Q&A and the uh, questions at the end of it and the uh, giving with the books. It's like I got to put together some of the questions, so be sure and pay attention because what the questions at the end of the, sem of the presentation will be directly from the webinar. Uh, so we'll look at that. Let's go and jump in. And I will not be able to see your questions. So we will pause a couple of times. We'll turn back to Mike, and we will do a, a Q&A that way. So we will pause a few times during the presentation to get those. I do like the interactivity. So send Mike a question if there's any, any uh, audio issues or if I didn't say something clearly. Be sure and do that because we will have the interaction. Okay. So in general, all trading does involve risk. That's just a natural component of the trading. What we will be doing, at least from my experience or from things that I've learned and and just through, through working with traders and, and being in the business for, uh, gosh, 10 years now, is putting these into context can limit your risk, 
couple of things, putting trades into that context can prevent you from making a trade that's about to fail. Uh, we'll see how that happens. It can't prevent all failure trades, but that's what we're looking to do in general as a probability over time as a trading strategy, is reduce risk as much as possible, you know, but not to the point that it's perfect, and try to maximize opportunities also as much as possible. So not being blindsided if we maybe miss a certain detail or a certain component uh, of the bigger picture. Day structure, trend day, range day, uh, what's happening on the bigger picture, etc. So again, just kind of limiting risk and maximizing our potential for profits for our individual trades. That's how the presentation will, will focus on. And, and that's just really it. What we should take away from this discussion today and to start this new year, really each trade that we take, and I'm assuming most of us are intraday or, or short-term short -term traders, that's the audience of futures, maybe ETFs, individual stocks. So the examples will be on the S&P, but you can translate this to any kind of market or time frame that, you, that you're using. But it's geared towards those intraday traders that, uh, of us. So each trade that we take is part of a larger whole. It's not just, again, not just a flag, not just a triangle, a breakout from a rectangle or a, a reversal trade. And in the trading course and in my strategies, I like to group trades into one of four different areas. Retracements, those are my favorites. Those are classic uh, pro-trend opportunities. Breakouts would be also pro-trend. Could be also counter-trend, but a mostly pro-trend. A breakout from a consolidation triangle or a resistance or support level. A fade, a fade is going to be a counter-trend trade. Maybe the upper Bollinger Band, uh, maybe there's a divergence or reversal candle will play a fade. And the other one's going to be a reversal trade. I try to stay away from those, but there are certain points where we take those reversal trades. So breakouts, reversals, retracements, and fades, but they are part of a bigger concept. The bigger picture, higher time frames, say the daily chart, or as we'll talk about shortly, the narrative. And that's really the presentation. Narrative, planning for the next day, using the higher frame. Uh, day structure, which is going to be, in general, range or trends. And, uh, and the strategies that, that accompany those planning. And finally, how to actually execute and put these trades on, specifically targeting your risk tolerance, your experience to uh, what tactic you're looking to put on when you do a trade. Now, when working with traders, and just in my experience too, these are just common statements that maybe I've had too, uh, maybe you've had as well, but this, hopefully the presentation will help address some of these. I never know what to look for. I see all these price patterns, all these squiggly lines, all these indicators. I, I just don't know what to look at. I, I have no idea. I, I'm just lost. Uh, everything happens so fast, even if you know what to look for. I see something out here. It's a flag. Here it's a head and shoulders. Here it's a triangle, whatever the, the, the setup is. But I don't really enter. And as I enter, the move's maybe halfway finished, or I just don't enter at all. It's already over. The breakout occurred. Done. I missed the trade. That, that's no fun. I know there's a larger picture at work. I know I can do this, but I just can't figure it out just yet. And how do some people make this look so easy? Well, I'm just, I just can't take it. I'm just frustrated. And of course, the, <laughs> maybe the worst of them, it's all random. There's no order. Just, just randomness. There's no point. You know, we'll see how that's, uh, that's not true. Trading is just probabilities. There's no certainty. There's no guarantee. Uh, it, it's just probabilistic setups and opportunities trying to play more successful trades than losing or stop out trades, and then on the trades that we win, that we have our profit, making more money than we risk when we lose. So that's really, the, trading in general can really sum it up in that. Probabilistic opportunities, uh, winning more times than we lose, and getting more money when we win than when we lose. That's of course the goal. <laughs> it's a lot harder than that, but that's what we'll work towards as traders. So the broader narrative is really just uh, the broader factors, news, not specific news, but and not individual earnings or things like that for stocks, but what's going on? This is correlated with the primary trend, monthly chart, big picture. And even if you're intraday, this still matters. It's what's driving the market. We'll take a couple of examples of what's happening now, uh, but just Getting this wrong or not even looking at it can put us on the wrong side of the market. 
trying to short a market that's driven up by euphoria or short squeezes or other kind of bullish factors. And we see these little intraday sell signals that are in contrast with the bigger picture. Uh, that will be considered limiting loss, not taking trades that go directly against the broader picture when we can uh, assess that. And it's just organization. This is something you would not do on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe not even a week-to-week -week basis. It's broader picture does not change. I think the tech bubble, tech bubble crash, housing market run-up, housing market crash, financial crash, we'll see those. But these are things that uh, six months to a year, if not longer. But the goal even as an intraday trader is to know when you're putting a trade on, whether you're going in the direction of that narrative, bigger picture, or against. Of course, obviously not saying you can't go against it, but know what the trade that you're taking will be doing. It just really helps conceptualize and guide your decisions. And just the general statement, uh, even I as an entry trader, I don't miss the forest or what's going on. News, major, major, major events for our little intraday five-minute flags, etc. So the narrative is just a broader example from the last uh, really about 15 years. I got started trading, really I'd say investing, not trading, but investing with a lot of people during the tech bubble rise. Uh, Alan Greenspan eventually would call it uh, the ir irrational exuberance, where prices were going up and they were detached from value, and so just not talk technically, but fundamentally. A company with very low fundamentals or even negative cash flow or high debt should not be going up every single day, but the fact was that it was stocks with fundamentals that were strong, were not seeing the same type of rise in their stock prices. The big factor was it was irrational, but it was real. It was happening. And if you try to short you know, Qualcomm or those big stocks that were going up X number of percent per day, you, you wouldn't make it. And, and that's the thing. Uh, the narrative going against that can really hurt. Going with it can help. But uh, that's even as an intraday frame, what makes sense to us in the short-term world, this should be happening, goes against the narrative. And it was irrational, and it had to end, and of course it ended with the crash. And of course the exact opposite is true. If you're trying to buy and trying to find that bottom, uh, be bull on in an intraday or short-term frame when the whole market's collapsing around you as part of the narrative, that, that won't work either. And that was... a uh, Really the run-up and the, and, the, and the crash down. The narrative of the other four to six was kind of the liquidity-fueled interest rates were low and uh, the housing market was, was kind of the central focus. So we had another bubble. It was in housing. But as an intraday trader, there really wasn't much because the market in general was low volatility and fast-forwarding. Uh, housing, that kind of the, the big deal there, which led to the unwinding of the financial system, and the crash from 07 to 08 and 09. Same thing, trying to be a really grand bear, or a really grand bull, trying to fight that big narrative was, uh, for some accounts, was fatal. And, and the same thing has been true from 2009 to present. Being a long-term bear, or even a short-term bear, with this what we call liquidity field recovery, QE1, QE3, just a general recovery, but it's also fueled by stimulus. So that, that's been dangerous to go against that, even on an intraday frame. So I'm going to get a couple of interactivity in here, get the, uh, some of the traders into question. Michael, to, to the question, because I can't see your question, we'll turn back to Mike. What do you think are some of the factors that are driving the current narrative? OK, so guys, uh, go ahead and type in. See Vance is saying uh, European crisis. Exactly, yeah. that's uh, one of the European. Mm -hmm. Jared says wall of worry. Thomas says sovereign debt crisis. A lot of yeah, euro yeah. crisis. Uh, the fiscal cliff. Uh, government debt. Yep, that's e exactly right. Yeah, keep going. Uh, Fed liquidity. Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, no one right answer, by the way. Right. Just, yeah, keep going. Sandy says the world is just fine. A new U.S. bull market. Yeah. Uh, Chinese growth, jobs being exported. So obviously a lot of factors. Yeah, precisely. And, and uh, you're right. Thank you, Mike. That, that's exactly right. 
the narrative has been the bigger picture has been liquidity, QE1, QE2, twist, twist 2, QE3, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Bank of Japan bailing, or, uh, stimulus, uh, Europe stimulus. It's also, that's the broader picture, but it's also government been a part of it. This was the Europe, when the Europe really first came to the headlines, I guess was over, it's been the last few years, but a uh, major issue was 2011, 2010. Um, more Europe in here, but that was that, and that was a bearish factor. Uh, Congress, <laughs> to be funny, has not exactly been the friendliest thing for the market. Uh, some of the most biggest, the, the biggest down moves have been directly related to congressional inaction, fiscal cliff, exactly. We had a week in the end of December that was just five days in a row down because uh, the House didn't really pass the, uh, the, the bill there. So we had a five day down day because of that. And of course, a two-day stellar up rally, which we're still basking in the glory of this up rally here, so to speak, as a result of the positive resolution. Um, the debt downgrade uh, from the S&P, that was part of it. Uh, Operation Twist, Operation uh, QE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're right, congressional action or inaction, Europe sovereign debt crisis, uh, overseas markets, intervention, QE, all these things play into short-term and broader-term narratives. And those do certainly affect us as intraday traders. All right, let's see. Okay, now, that the narrative is just kind of a general thing. That's the take of the weekly, monthly theme. This is not a day-to-day -day thing. What is a day-to-day -day thing is your game planning. And this helped me a whole lot. This is what I do with the intraday reports, and just I've been doing this for for quite some time, it's to physically write down what I expect the market to do. Not just what my expectations are, but the alternate thesis. So if we're in a low volatility area, if we're not, I'm looking for certain things, you know, looking for uh, more range days, so to speak. If we're looking for a high volatility environment, I'm going to be more active with trades and really playing much, much, much more aggressively because you can take more profits, especially if trend days are, are more profit are more probable in high volatility environments than low. I like trend days. We'll see that shortly, but uh, I'm a big retracement trader of trend days. So I enjoy high volatility. So but that that's what we're looking for. Uh, and it ties into the game theory of the bigger picture. Just recently we were all planning about the fiscal cliff, yes or no, yes would be a bullish thing, no would be a bearish thing. Etc. So that ties into charts. Uh, mainly, the game plan is done off your charts, done off the for me the daily chart, 30-minute chart, and the hourly. I'm looking for anything that's really really obvious. Uh, 1475 in the S&P, very very obvious. Now the Russell has broken to new highs. Nothing really obvious there because it's a breakout opportunity. But for stocks, for the S&P, for the Dow, for the Nasdaq, we have obvious levels from 2012, and that's just the prior highs. If you do any kind of Fibonacci, that would help. Moving averages, or anything trend line. Those who've been, in really December into, somewhere into January, but mostly December, in a rising parallel trend line channel that's just drawn by trend lines. So factors on the higher time frame uh, would help us determine what the next day or next series of days uh, may be doing. And that's what a grand market profile question. You don't have to do the charts of the A, B, C, D, et cetera, but just the, the grand theme or the, one of the questions they ask frequently is, what is the market trying to do? Go up, go down, break resistance, turn back from resistance, the concepts like that. And the second question, how well is it doing it? So if the market is currently, let's say, uptrending and making higher highs, and doing so in higher volume and higher internals and higher momentum, that suggests positive continuity. So the trend should continue. Trade those retracements and expect higher prices, et cetera. If that same thing's happening, but we're seeing divergences in internals and volume and momentum, et cetera, and maybe some reversal candles of the upper Bollinger, we'll see the next example. Actually, we'll go to that now. That would not be the same thing. So. This is a game planning scenario from end of really October 2012. Somewhat similar to now, but not, not so much. But just look at the right side of the chart. Assume this is the, the next day and we're the evening session that we're, we're planning out what should happen the next day. So S&P is up into 1460. 
uh, negative divergences in volume, rate of change. It's at the upper Bollinger Band. It has the reversal candle, little doji. You know, what what should be the thesis? And the dominant thesis probably I would expect would be a movement down. Uh, so anything under 15, 14, 40, 55, et cetera, maybe would target 14, 40. So that's the thing. The market should, in a dominant thesis, fall. But that doesn't mean the market's going to fall. We're going to play bearish trades if that happens intraday. But if it doesn't, we'll play bullish for our alternate or unexpected thesis. So here's what a uh, sample game plan might be. You start with the current condition, and that condition will come from your higher frames. Daily chart, 30 minutes, hourly, maybe even the weekly. So just in the example above, we'll look back at it quickly. See, price is into resistance with negative divergences. Dominant thesis, it's the one down here in the lower end, that price will reverse or trade lower tomorrow, the next day, the next series of days toward a lower target. And that's what the expectation is. If that thesis takes place in real time, we'll trade short sell intraday trades. We'll look for breakdowns, retracements, uh, maybe even some uh, you know, reversal trades that go lower. But that doesn't mean the market's going to fall. It doesn't. It's just probability. So we as traders have to be creative and think of the alternate thesis. And in this case, the price breaks right on through, which is a trend continuity. Gaps above resistance, the upper Bollinger, the high of the uh, prior session. And if so, we either don't play, because we're not looking for that to happen, or we play aggressive buy opportunities. I like to call them pop stops. Uh, you can call them a short squeeze. It's just the bears who thought the market was going to stall at that level, correctly so, when in real time the market breaks through, you're either going to have to take your stop loss, which is a buy opportunity, or if it goes higher, lose more money. So these tend to fuel breakouts. So that's your alternate thesis planning. We're not saying the market's going to fall because it's a reversal candle with divergences. We're saying it should, but if it doesn't, we'll instead look to be bullish. So be creative. Uh, sometimes bigger moves occur. This is one of my favorite phrases. If something should happen but doesn't happen, then it often leads to a bigger move in the opposite direction. So don't get trapped. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Traders that expect a sell-off position swing traders or whatever the case would be. But when they hit their stops, the market hits that stop level, they have to buy. So as intraday traders, we can come in and scoop in and pick up the pieces or trade those impulsive breakout moves that, quote, should not have happened. And that's profitable. Uh, it may defy logic, but that doesn't matter. It's trying to play what's really happening versus what should be happening. And with the factor that what should not happen from a logical or classical sense could lead to bigger moves. And uh, just the last thought about game planning. Determine whether you're going to be a buyer or seller off the open. You're going to see if there's a gap, and we'll see shortly how this creates day structure, range, trend, etc., and, and how to play that in real time. But the night before and the evening after the market closes, you should sit down with your charts, take about an hour, 30 minutes, and just plan for what the market should do and how you are going to react to that. Um, and that's just what we're looking to do in terms of our game planning. For example, if the market falls to a trend line and has a reversal candle up, it should be going higher. So we'll look to trade intraday bullishly if that happens, but it may break on through. So. Uh, be objective, be creative. Don't just get caught up in the market has a doji, the market has a divergence. It's got to go up. It doesn't. Anything can throw that off. Congress can throw that off. Uh, a news event can throw that off, uh, et cetera. So remember, we in the technical world, trading world, are not the only ones that affect stock prices. There are fundamental analysts, quantitative analysts, and course traders of those styles 
that may not even see what we see. So uh, keep that in mind. Now, we'll, we'll pause this at the halfway point. So, Mike, we'll turn back for questions so far on anything about the narrative or sure. game planning. Uh, all right, guys, so go ahead and type in some questions if you have them. I see a few on the screen, but I also wanted to ask a couple of my own. So, Corey, are, are you pretty much positioning, positioning, sorry, positioning <laughs> yourself uh, one way or the other and then sticking with that throughout the day? You don't, you don't swap back and forth from long to short, short, long, long, short. You more or less decide longs, and then you wait for the market to come to you. Is that is that right? Is that wrong? What are, what are you doing? Um, yeah, well, we'll look at the day structure. That's the next thing. What we're looking okay. to do is build the, the picture down. So we'll talk about that in terms of day structure. And sometimes if you have a dominant thesis that something should happen, you, you don't have to trade. So right. don't think that we have to take advantage of every last opportunity. You make I've made the best trades, and I think most people have made the best trades. When they see the market, they get in the field, they get in the zone, whatever you want to call it. And they said the market's going to go up to, for example, the market went down uh, yesterday. And so I was looking for that to happen. And it was a morning session sell-off. And there were some really good trades that way. But the market reversed midday. I will actually look at that uh, later in the presentation. So, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, exactly. So we're going to monitor the session throughout the day. And especially so, in terms of, go ahead. Okay. So, like, uh, as part of your game plan, though, do, do you have, like, areas of interest that you basically set on your hands and wait for price to come to that level? Before you take a trade, or what is that part of your plan for the day? Is the sure. certain certain price points, certain areas? Absolutely. So yesterday, we'll look just real quick. See if I can go to the slide real quick. Uh, 1460 was the key area in the S and P. Uh, on the futures, not so much, but on the S and P itself, 1460 was my key level, and on the SPY, I think it was 146. And the S and P is a little bit, the future is a little bit different, but the market did gap under that level. So of course, we're playing short in the morning session. And that worked out very well. So the real-time trades aligned with our thesis. And that led for some retracements and some even some breakdowns. But that went well. Of course, the market didn't go all the way down. It stalled. It's some divergences and went up. So if you're shorting this whole movement up, we'll look at some of the things later. But yeah, you're making adjustments. But yes, you do have normally a key level okay. trigger point. And for, uh, it could be a moving average, could be a round number. Uh, anything like that. So yeah, you would have those and then implement your plan in real time. Sure. And how important would you say it is for you to uh, have patience in waiting for the market to come to that level? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have some jokes. I work with a team in Huntsville here. And we have a lot of jokes just because I, I, I do tend to jump the gun. Um, and so like a cradle, I discussed that in the book, where the market has to cross over uh, the moving averages, 20 and 50 EMAs, have to cross over. The market has to come and touch those EMAs, preferably form a reversal candle, and then fall down from there if you're looking to go short. Um, and so we were discussing that. We were on the phone, and I was I put a trader on. Here, here comes. Here's a trader. Here's a trader. Here, here, and of course, you know, the market did not touch the trader. My buddy was uh, not doing that. And of course. The market broke through higher and stopped me out, and he still jokes to say, "Oh, it's a cradle. Oh, make sure." <laughs> so the point, the point is, make sure that the signal occurs. Don't, you know, fudge it. Don't uh, pretend that it's there when it's not. Uh, that way, you keep yourself grounded. And that way, you can reassess your statistics, your trades. If you're just doing things off the fly, you can't right. really go back and say what's working, what's not. Right. See so that right. that would not be a trade that worked, but I did it anyway. Right, so but if you if you plan right, but if you plan ahead of time, you know these areas of interest, then you know if you if you can't wait for the market to come to those levels, if you're just trading in the middle of nowhere, then you know it's impossible to really measure what you're doing. That's my opinion. So yeah, yeah, and, and plus a lot of some of the best opportunities, especially reversal trades, will occur uh, onto a higher time frame level. So the market will so let's say it will fall down into a round number or something. Right. And uh, but it's an obvious level. It's not just some random Fibonacci. It's, it's an obvious level. And as the real time chart shows positive divergences and other kind of factors, see, technical analysis in general is a self fulfilling prophecy. We see the same things. We take the same trades. And so we, uh, right. you know, we make the same positions or the same mistakes. That's what pop stops are. Short squeezes. The market should do this, but doesn't. So yeah, let it happen. And one thing that helps too is um, if you miss. Don't worry about it. If if you don't take a trade, I know sometimes some traders that are really uh, that love to trade and really just get excited about this. They uh, one of the worst things is missing a trade. Um, but to me, that's not like a bad thing. It, one of which is losing money. So getting in there before a signal happens, or before a level happens, or before 
whatever you think should happen, the trigger is, that can be worse because if the market doesn't trigger these certain triggers or people go on Twitter or whatever the case is, the feedback loop doesn't happen, then the signal, you know, never, if, it's still never, if the market never breaks a key level, it won't trigger the stop losses, it won't trigger the new buy orders, and of course nothing's going to happen. So you almost need to let that happen, and if you miss it, <laughs> trust me, I've been doing this for quite some time, you will get a new signal. You may not have that exact signal, but uh, there will be another signal. So <laughs> just because you miss one opportunity doesn't mean your, your uh, trading career is over sure. <laughs> by no means. Okay, I see a couple of questions here. Uh, Vance says, uh, when you say adapt in real time, can you can you explain in more detail when or what makes you change tactics? For example, yeah, uh, let's let's we'll go a couple. Of, that's it's going to come up in the day structure specifically okay. with the random reversal. Yeah, any more questions on this? Because it's going to come up in the the random okay. reversal. Sure. And then uh, also, how do you protect against being too flexible and changing too often? Yeah, that's a danger. Um, and that's what the, some of the presentations working on is that we're building. See, in terms of what we're talking about now broader picture with right now uh, it's QE and they're going to come in and save the market or whatever whatever you want to talk about it, it's a bullish structure until proven otherwise so any kind of uh, bearish trades are suspect so that's going to be your broader governing thesis and that's not going to change right unless chairman Bernanke says oh QE's done in which case that's <laughs> well, let's start sure. shorting that but that's not the way it is so that, that's your broader picture helps give you uh, a concept. So that, that's your underlying thing, is that there is some type of bullish force out there that's helping this market go up. So that's right. factor one. Factor two is your higher time frame, uh, key levels, and oh, that's real time. So that would, I would imagine, that as an intraday trader without the higher time frame structure, without the higher time frame levels, the trend, just knowing where the price is and what it's trying to do in the bigger picture, yeah, that, can, that can thwart uh, your your ambitions intraday and just I'm short I'm long I'm short I'm no 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 it's again narrative uh, game plan which is a yes or no thing I'm a bull I'm a bear at dominant uh, or alternate and then we'll talk shortly next is is that's gonna be played out in real time true sure. trend okay. day range day round reversal all right so let's do the next section I think some of these questions might be answered there yeah, good, good. Uh, thank you for asking the questions there, because th this is <laughs> exactly what I'm what I'm looking for in terms of presentation. Um, this this is going to answer some of the questions because, again, bigger picture is a top level game planning is for the next trading session, and this talking about now uh, day structure it really tells you what to expect and what to do. Um, for me, trend days are my sort of bread and butter. I make some of the best profitable trades on that. The easiest, most efficient. Trading is just simply it sounds simple, but we're not here to be complex. Buying retracements on a trend day, simple as that. It's profitable. It works. Uh, range days are more common uh, than obviously trend days. Um, to playing fade trades, well, actually, we'll, we'll skip through and look at the specifics on these. But yeah, breaking into trend day, range day, and the failure of a trend day is a rounded reversal. Determining day structure helps us look at what indicators to focus on, you know, moving averages, divergences, uh, what trades to take, breakouts, fades, etc. So you will be, well I, if you're using the strategies that I'm using, would be employing or determining what trades you take based on what's happened in the morning, Tra uh, day structure. So for example, We'll look at range days shortly, but uh, just assume temporarily, that should be your number one rule of, of detection anyway, is that today or the next session will be a range day. You're almost doing a scientific inquiry, wherein you're assuming the null hypothesis, and the market's going to have to prove you wrong uh, by doing something unusual, because trend days may happen five days out of the month, hopefully more, but usually not, uh, five, six, seven days at the most. Uh, unless it's a really high volatile environment in the bigger picture. But anyway, assume that tomorrow will be a range session. And if in so doing, uh, it's just a time sequence. So you have your game plan from the night before, then you wake up in the morning. Has Asia or Europe done anything out of the ordinary? If it has not, then it should be a range day. Next would be the, that's when you wake up. Look at the futures, look at the news. Second is about an hour before the market opens, any kind of news. We have the first Friday of the month is your jobs report. Uh, third Friday is your futures and 
well, not always features, but options, sometimes features options, but expiration. Sometimes there's a really big news event, uh, fiscal cliff. That, that the con Congress voted down the fiscal cliff at, uh, well, on a Thursday night, and that led to a big, big, big sell-off the next day, a trend day down. Uh, that was abnormal <laughs> by all means. And of course they solved the fiscal cliff on, on the evening, uh, really with a couple of hours to spare, and the market gapped up and trended uh, all the way up. So the uh, main idea, range days, are, nothing's out of the ordinary. And of course the open, is there a gap or not? If there is not a gap, it should be expected to be a low volatility or a range session, as opposed to a big gap that doesn't fill. Then you're looking at the first hour. Anything out of the ordinary? No. And I run a scan that looks at relative volume. So you're looking at relative volume, not what's happening now, but what's happened in the last 20 days. Is the first 30 minutes abnormal? If so, that tends toward a trend day. If not, range day. And of course, um, by noon. So we're looking most of this factor of the tr of the uh, day structure is in the first hour free market uh, open in the first hour. That's the rest of your session is, is odds would favor one of the two, range or trend. And a little extra note is sometimes a trend day can fail. We'll just monitor that throughout the session. So any kind of boundaries from the range, no boundaries, meaning the market just gapped up and went on higher, or didn't even try to fill the gap, or if there was a small gap, it was filled, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, you're just looking at this and quantifying uh, odds of trend versus range. Boundaries, yes or no. And then unusual activity, high tick, any kind of extreme or spike, spike in volume, uh, volatility, expansion, higher time frame, breakout. Uh, the Russell broke to new highs. So that was obviously a, a breakout thing that drew in more money. So the same would be true if the S&P continued that and, and also broke out. So that would uh, generate one would think a trend day if it breaks the highs. Uh, so detection, number one rule of detection is to be a scientist, that today will not be a trend day. It's going to be a range day. Uh, market must prove and make them of any kind of unusual activity. So if even the market shows a trend day activity early, monitor it throughout the day. And that was actually the question, do I just, I'm bullish, or let's say I expect the market, this happened recently, uh, was into a support level, and it broke above the support level and gapped and began moving higher. Uh, do we just go along the whole way through? No, you're watching and monitoring for any kind of divergences and what we'll talk about in just a moment with respect to uh, rounded reversals, failed trend days. I'm gonna go ahead and jump to these because we have a few more minutes and I'll watch cover. So again, nothing out of the ordinary, no gap, no activity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're looking to play fades, fade. That is, if the market goes up, you're going to short it. If it goes down, you're going to buy it. Off boundaries. For me, uh, it's the uh, Bollinger Band, standard 20 period Bollinger Band. You can draw trend lines, et cetera. But you're looking at the big three, big, big, big three. I want to stress these for range days. Bollinger Bands, five minute reversal candle, doji, shooting star, hammer, be simple. And any kind of I like to go to the one minute chart. One minute chart divergences in tick and momentum and breadth. In other words, market internal volume. So Bollinger Extreme, reversal candle, one minute divergence. There you go. That, that's, that's your range day trade, and that works quite well. Uh, moving average trades, they won't. And they'll fail. Uh, price will chop around through them. December 14, we had a little bit. The gap down, gap was really not quite filled, but it pushed this ES futures, uh, December 24th. Gap, lower Bollinger, filled uh, the price low, not quite the gap. The first hour, there's not really any trades, not much to do there. Uh, not much there either, so our first trade will be a potential uh, range day fade, a little bit of a divergence, and of course that worked the upper Bollinger, so you're just playing Bollinger to Bollinger. Divergence, divergence, Bollinger, reversal candle. That's your trend, that's your range day identification, and if, see, it broke out. If we can draw on the chart, but the, uh, uh, it broke out into the close, and you're stopped. You don't play anymore, because uh, the market broke from what it should be doing. It should have formed divergences at the lower Bollinger. Uh, it didn't. 
new tick low, etc. So you're just you're done. No more trades. That's your day. Um, and a range day. The opposite would be a trend day. Many things are out of the ordinary. So extreme readings in tick, volume, uh, any kind of overnight activity, Congress messed something up, Congress solved something that it just messed up, something like that. Um, a headline in Europe, uh, Chancellor Merkel did something positive or negative with respect to Germany, uh, to uh, Greece. So that they bail them out, did Greece just have some other headache happen to them? European news, uh, that's a factor in, in our current uh, environment. Still is. It's, it's fallen off the table, but, but it is. So opening gap that does not fill, or maybe there's a partial fill but not a full fill, and then clear, obvious range expansion outside of price boundaries, above a pivot level, whatever you're looking at. And I just on the on the blog I keep a little post. It's a compilation of 20, 21 posts on trend days, but just the fact there is a market opens at one extreme and closes at the other. Uh, so monitor relative to moving averages by your breakouts from a range or from a you know, triangle, rectangle, prior high. For me, it's retracement trades. Those are my kind of bread and butter on trend days. And uh, that's what you're doing. You're just really trading retracements as long as the price trend continues to stay above the 20 period exponential moving average on a five minute chart. Um, I will be quite angry if, I, if I'm working with a trader or a client that if they short a trend day, if it's in a bullish trend day and they are trying to short call that top, I'll be quite angry with them because that's just a, not a good way to do that. So you're going to lose money just about almost all the time. And in fact, those who fight trend days tend to contribute to their motion. It's very tempting. I know I've been there, done it quite a few times as a trader. Um, sometimes I don't do it now. I've just had this hard rule um, that trend days are not to be faded, are not to be played for a reversal. Um, because if you do so, so you short a high, and it just pauses a little bit and goes back and takes out the high, you're going to stop out, or hopefully you should, and your trade will be a buy that will perpetuate that trend. So, uh, so you know, don't do that. And basically ignore everything and trade with the trend unless, asterisk, and we'll look at how uh, we can actually trade against the trend, but that's, <laughs> don't just jump out of doing that. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, December 18, this is not quite a super, super trend day. It was a trend day, but it did not quite occur with a big opening gap. But the first move was a flag. It already had a bullish move. So the, the 2050 EMA orientation, 20 above the 50, five minute chart of the uh, S&P futures. So it had already been with an upside move. So you, could, you can't see on the left side of the chart, but this is an uptrend already. And so this is just a simple flag, no, nothing to it, just a flag. Uh, entry uh, 1427 and uh, the target quite exceeded it. So you're going to exit your flag trades into, say, an upper Bollinger. When price breaks a rising trend line, you can drop to the one minute chart especially, or some kind of five minute reversal candle. So the goal is to hold these trades as long as you possibly can and don't just be spooked out. And just keep trading these retracements as long as price remains above these EMAs. And especially have confidence if the price is making new highs and tick makes corresponding new highs. So the confirmation, trend day should continue, uh, et cetera. So you're just really buying um, breakouts of a flag trend line or a retracement to a moving average. This is where we adapt. You know, if you started trying to trade long in a trend day, just close your eyes and bought every single dip, that may work for some days, but not for all. And there's just, you know, we have to adapt in real time. So a rounded reversal is a failed trend day. It's a trend day that starts off in, in the trend day direction, but otherwise maybe it hits a higher time frame target, which is fine, uh, but it fails. And a couple of things that precede rounded reversals are non-confirmations, divergences, but it's not just one divergence, it's a multi-swing, internal, uh, momentum, volume, breadth, I use tick, so tick is your difference of stocks ticking up versus those ticking down, it's just an internal. And uh, kick off, we'll look at that in a chart, it's best to see it in a chart, but it's when the price, say, is at a uh, new or close to the highs, price is at the highs of a bullish trend day, but the tick starts registering new intraday lows. 
It's a, it's a concept from Richard Wyckoff uh, called a sign of strength, sign of weakness. But if you start seeing pronounced weakness in the tick when price is at the highs, yeah, not a good sign to keep playing trend continuity. The final thing would be a break of the 50 period EMA, which is your exponential moving average, five minute chart, or any kind of hand drawn trend line. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, we had the dominant thesis, very, very, very high probability. Uh, I think I actually was giving a presentation, uh, the morning briefing for, uh, for um, this, but it, it, it fell down. Uh, and actually, it, it broke 1460 on the index and then began to actually gap under and fell lower. There wasn't a whole lot of chances to play retracements, but this, this is, again, the alignment of the dominant thesis with real-time activity. Uh, and the target, I think, was 1450. And uh, on the index, it hit that. And can you see where I highlighted? The tick is making sequential higher lows when price is making lower lows. That's a divergence. That's not all. Uh, the next movement in the tick was a, we call it a kickoff. Wyckoff would call it a sign of strength. It's a hidden secret. Not a secret, it's a hidden signal that tick or momentum is making when price is just coming up off the low. And that signals don't take that retracement. Stand aside and uh, look for the market to then break the 50 EMA. And it finally did so, really. It wasn't much trades on this day unless you went off the low, but uh, that's not recommended. So a little flag into the close. So a morning sell-off, stagnant, not much really to do, but just the market's making bullish movements. Could have bought the break about the 50, brought the first tracement, et cetera. So for me, not it's really about two, three, four trades a day. We're not talking 10 trades a day. Uh, it's based on the game plan and real-time implementation. The rounded reversals are failed trend days that occur, that have divergences and kickoffs, which is st visual strength in the tick when price is not making new highs. Early warning signal. All right, we have a few more minutes. We're going to go over execution tactics. And, yeah, I want to uh, let you know this that is actually it's, well, obviously <laughs> putting a trade on. It's fine if you okay. want to run over a few but, minutes. It's not a problem, so don't worry. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I won't rush at this thing because execution tactics, honestly, there. I've given a presentation on this, and <laughs> the the audience seems to be really bored. But um, this is critical for, for professional, serious traders. Um, execution tactics is critical. Uh, this is putting a trade on and taking it off. Sounds really simplistic, but if you have, if you're anxious or nervous or if you're uh, really the risk tolerance is what we're talking about, your experiences, your personality. For me, I'm a conservative trader. I want to wait for as much information as possible, and I'm, I don't like risk. And so I'll actually exit a trade sometimes earlier than I should, which is a conservative method, and I'll enter a trade sometimes later than I should, which is also conservative. I don't do well doing aggressive maneuvers, breakouts and reversals. I just don't. Uh, and, and just the opposite. I've had clients, other, other colleagues, that are that they just don't do conservative. They have to be in the market. They have to take those breakouts, and they do well doing it. So don't think that, uh, you know, here's Corey telling you take a flag or take a breakout or whatever. Maximize or, or, or match the execution tactic with your strategies and your well, strategies with your personality. And it may change over time, but... Uh, do that because otherwise it will be difficult to execute a trade which under the condition of uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen next if you're too too conservative you won't put the trade on and that's not good if you're too aggressive you'll put on marginal or or, or un, inappropriate trades that's not good either anyway so a trade uh, would be a opportunity recognition entering placing stops managing and then exiting, and there's little things that can go wrong in each of these factors. I'm sure we've all done errors. I've done errors in all of them, but uh, that will happen. I've learned from them, and we learn from our mistakes. That's fine. That's the way it works. But there are four components to a trade. And uh, putting a trade on at an inflection point, say the blue line it is, it's a trend line. Maybe it's a moving average, but whatever it is, this can also go with your game planning, but uh, 
say this is a one minute chart or five minute chart, whatever. The market is either going to hit that trend line and come up off of it, which is a retracement trade, or it's going to break under it, which is a breakdown trade. If you think it's going to break up and go higher and retrace, continue the trend, you have three points, two really, uh, two strategies to get that trade on. And these are to be determined ahead of this trade. This is your core. This is your trading plan. This is not what I feel like or, or whatever. This is, this is part of your business plan. Uh, will I enter a trade early or will I enter it later? Um, so early is going to be buying from the sellers, maybe using limit orders. But after the market hits that level and inflects up off of it, you, know, you see it in real time, but I don't take the trade, this is what happens. Uh, you're looking for too much confirmation or something. Uh, the market may break a, the high of the reversal, whatever the case is, break a trend line. But anyway, if you wait for the market to come up off of the inflection point, you're buying with buyers. Nothing wrong with that. That's what I do. Uh, but it is uh, best to use market orders because if you use 11 orders and the market's moving quickly, we all saw this trade, we all sent a tweet out about it or whatever the case is, and you don't get the trade on, you're, you're going to miss it. If you use a limit order and the market just surges off that point, you miss the trade. So there are good things and bad things for uh, aggressive, good things and bad things for conservative. Um, and so just in general, aggressive tactics focus on monetary edge. They're going to be entering at support, which makes their stop loss tighter or closer inherently. It also makes their target wider or larger. Uh, they're going to be, as opposed to a conservative, which is going to be entering a little bit above the inflection point, their stop will be a little bit wider, and the distance toward the target will be smaller. That sounds bad, it is, in terms of monetary edge, but what if you just have to have a feel-good trade? You've had a three or four losers in a row, and you just got to get something good that may help. Getting Focusing on accuracy, which is, I'm only going to take these perfect, perfect, perfect setups. Fine. You'll trade less, you'll have a higher accuracy rate, but you might not make as much money as somebody who was more aggressive. Again, don't if you're conservative, don't jump in and play aggressive. If you're aggressive, you're going to struggle to play conservatively. Uh, again, conservative, prove it to me, they're going to enter late after a turn. More than not, they'll enter or actually exit early. Uh, tactics and terms, there are almost two more slides, we'll get the questions. Two, uh, just for retracements in general. If you're looking to trade a going back, just see a retracement, right? The market's in an uptrend pulling back to a inflection point. So an aggressive trader would get in, boom, trades on, executed. Get that order in there into the market. Futures contract, you know, order filled. Uh, was when it touches a moving average, touches a Fibonacci, if you use an intraday, uh, touches a trend line, et cetera, keywords touches. Boom, done, finished. Versus a conservative trader who will see the same thing. They'll see the price touch that level, but they'll wait for it to break above a reversal candle. They'll wait for a five-minute chart, maybe a one-minute, mostly a five-minute chart, to form a doji, hammer, something. And that's not even enough. The price has to break above that hammer to get in the execution, which is fine because it gives you a spot to enter and a place to rest your orders, but, but there it is. A uh, break above a falling trend line, or otherwise break above some other prior swing high. That's your difference. We'll look at that visually with uh, retracements. So aggressive traders will buy exactly, boom, there it is. It, it, it touched the level, 38.2% Fibonacci, trend line, you know, trend line, whatever, moving average, done. I'm in. My stop is relatively close, not exactly under that level, but you know, maybe one ATR, average true range, whatever your stop loss strategy is, it's under that level. And of course, a target may be the prior high, maybe even preferably above that. Versus, if you're conservative, you'll see that reversal hammer, you'll wait for it to develop. By the way, if you're in real time, you won't see this hammer uh, if you execute into the uh, 20 EMA, by definition, right? That, that doesn't exist <laughs> in real time. So it's a big red candle in real time. Uh, but in, 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 in real time, if you're conservative, you'll wait for that candle to form, price to break above the high, 
price to break above a trend line or just go ahead and wait for price to break above that prior high. Either way, the price, if it's a true retracement, should go higher than the prior high. Right? That's a, that's a retracement trade. So multiple ways to enter what seems to be as very simple as a retracement trade. So I'm looking forward to the, the Q&A session. This will be fun. Uh, but yeah, the, just general thoughts to conclude the, uh, the presentation. Uh, start with the broader narrative. And right now, that's the uh, QE, looking at Europe and watching them, Congress, what's going to be happening in the next couple of months is going to be the whole, uh, what's it called, the debt ceiling and the, the sequester. So that's going to come up probably March 2nd. We have some breathing room, <laughs> hopefully, until then. So we're going to be probably focusing for the moment on earnings. That probably will be driving the market theme just in the next few uh, days, if not weeks, is any kind of surprises in earnings. So uh, in, in terms of uh, broader uptrend and, and the fact that the, the Fed stands ready in case something goes wrong, uh, which is a warning to bears. And a game plan for the next day is just basically look at the higher time frame charts and uh, formulating plans and expect that these is what should happen, alternate what should not happen. But sometimes the market will make a bigger move when it doesn't uh, do what it should. Day structure will determine how we play and what we even use. A trend day will focus on moving averages, will generally ignore the Bollingers, and will ignore divergences if they exist you know, by themselves. Um, versus a range day, we're going to have to ignore those moving averages. Not going to work. We'll look at divergences and we'll focus on Bollinger Bands. That's a component of day structure, though. So um, that's when we don't just trade you know, the same indicator all the time. You're basing your trades based on day structure. And of course, you get that from the morning, pre-market, open in the first hour. Determines or helps you determine day structure. And your trades, the whole purpose of the presentation, really, is a, a flag is not a flag. You know, a, a triangle is not a triangle. It's based on all these other things, and that should help you limit your losses. And taking, say, a triangle that uh, breaks down in an uptrend day, whoops, and the market just keeps on going higher, or some other component of of that and your personal execution tactic, conservative, aggressive, moderate even, in the middle. And uh, trying to do that based on you and not somebody else. And so putting trades into a context, making decisions concrete, you know, objective, quantifiable, where you can go back and test them. You can put them in your journal and say, I took 13 flag trades on you know, five trend days and my results were da 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 da, where I took 18 fade trades on 13 trend days, and whatever the case is, you can quantify that and make improvements in your performance. And it's something not abstract. Well, I think it's going up, so I'm going to get long. No, no, no. It's, it's contextualized in a broader context in the day structure, game plan, and to top it all off, broader thesis. So we'll turn back to Mike and any kind of general question of the presentation. Hey, Corey. Uh, and then we'll do the uh, book giveaway. So there's a bunch of questions. And so before we get into these, I want to remind everybody that we are going to be giving away five autographed copies of Corey's book you see there on the screen. And uh, the way that I'm going to get in touch with you is through the forum. So if you don't already have a username on BMT, then just go to BigMikeTrading.com and click on register and creating a new account. It's free. It takes like 30 seconds. And that way, uh, if you're one of the five winners for the books, you can give me your, your username and then I'll be contacting you after the webinar to, uh, to get your address and everything and get everything over to Corey so we can get those books out to the winners. All right, so let's take a look at some of the questions. Um, Sandy says, does your game plan give you tunnel vision and how do you battle that if so? <laughs> Yes, thanks, Andy. Um, yes, it can and it does. Um, it happens, and we're, we're humans. Remember, we're not trading robots or algorithms. So, if I'm looking for, um, for example, I'll just use one, one that happened today. It was more of a range day, sort of yeah, trend day. Not, not, not so fancy today, but um, the, the example of let's go back to it. This was a really good example. Uh, the, the eighth. Um, yeah, so I was quite bearish. I wasn't super, super bearish, but the market was at an upper inflection point. We had divergences, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, the market is a fall. 
the morning session was great, but um, yeah, I didn't want them trading the rest of the session because there was no more bearish trades. That's that's okay, uh, but it just made me miss out on a couple of things. But that's fine, as opposed to saying if I were totally blinded uh, to a, uh, I was just wedded to the market has to fall because of factor X, Y, Z. See, at about a, this is Central Time, about 11:15, 11:30. That's a really classic uh, pro trend retracement trade. It's right here. You have reversal candles, um, etc., and the market it would have failed. It wouldn't have worked because uh, a retracement trade is going to target the prior low, if not even lower than that, and the market just would have stopped me out. So, uh, having blind reliance on day structure game plan that's going to hurt you because what you did not see, and I saw it, so that would maybe not do that, is the clear, 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 clear visual divergence and the immediate kickoff at 1030. Didn't make me a bull, but it prevented me from being bearish. So okay. yeah, don't be wedded, follow real time. Uh, Julie says, uh, when you look at yesterday's chart, the 1460 range, no pullbacks occurred that she could see to enter on. She trades a five minute chart and strong trends what do you think of using one-minute charts and watching for the market to move away uh, or towards pullbacks to the, to the EMA? Yeah, thanks, exactly. On like this, for example, on the uh, morning session, the fall here, there on a five-minute chart, there's not a place to get short. There just isn't. So you have to go to the one-minute chart, and you're looking at, so I can, you can do a, a shorter-term EMA, but I, use, I still use the 20 and the 50. And this pullback here, I think it pulled to the 20 EMA on the one-minute chart. And there was even a pullback this, I think, over here somewhere, and, and these two as well. So yes, and the and same thing with the game planning. So the five-minute chart would give you your expectation. You can trade off of that. But in a rapid moving market, five-minute bars are not going to give you really good uh, opportunities, or at least not good signals. So go to the one and use similar concepts. As an added bonus, you're going to see these divergences a little bit clearer sometimes than the... Uh, Five-minute chart. So the one-minute chart gives you added, well, it gives you more bars by definition, but it's also going to bring these EMAs by definition also closer, and you can have similar strategies, similar retracements. A uh, flag that was a very, really not a clear, but a good flag on the one-minute that just it's just three bars on a five. So yeah, in a big in a big uh, fast environment, or even looking at the let's go over here real quick to the one minute, sorry, the five minute uh, range day, you would see these diverge, especially this at 1230 Central, uh, really, really, really nice divergence that you probably missed on the five. Same thing here. So it doesn't look that great, but a uh, one minute chart, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Five uh, and one integration is what I do. Thomas wants to know, can you predict if the day is going to be a trend day or a range day? No, <laughs> no, Thomas. Um, <laughs> predicting no, but uh, well, I mean, it's true. I mean, it, it's it's odds and probabilities, so I, you know, right. in, in general. But but just this is how we do it. There's no perfect way, and I'm sure there's computers out there that do amazing things. But just watch, use your use your sense, um, not just that, but quantify. And it's just, it's it's a checklist. I would recommend you know copying this slide or on the recording having this copy the slide down and make your own checklist wherein. You're going to have, you wake up and you look over at the futures. You turn on CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever you, you turn on for your news and you see that anything really unexpected happened in the world, you know, yes, no. Um, Pre-market news, yes, no. What, and, of course, you're going to have a sense if there's really, really big, uh, you know, I was at a trading expo when Saddam Hussein was captured in, during the Iraq war. So that, that, made, <laughs> that was thing that happened, I think, at a 2 or 3 a.m. in our time. But... One of the people at the presentation seminar was doing research in it and wound up capturing that and you know got a, a couple of trades off of that. But yeah, that trend days occur from really big things that that occur. Um, call it Bin Laden was what well, was there, that thing too. So yeah, you can you can look at quantifiable metrics and news. Of course, the actual gap itself, yes or no. First hour, just describe it. A volume higher than normal. Uh, momentum higher than normal, ticker internals higher than normal, and then any kind of really obvious thing. So, and, and even right. if it's a trend day, it can fall into a rounded reversal. And of course, a range day can, if something happens midday, 
break into a trend. This, this isn't a concrete, it's a range day, it's a range day. It, no, it's real-time monitoring at, uh, we call them time markers. So, you know, the open first hour, noon, and then the, we call it the one o'clock breakout at central time, but it's, uh, you, would, you would quantify what's happening there and, and adapt if something really unexpected happens. If so, you may just stand aside, or if it's really, really big, you may um, try to trade that. Uh, Rob wants to know if you have any certain times of day that you enjoy trading the most. Uh, the morning. I, I'm almost exclusively at this point. If it's a range day, I'm going to stick around, but trend day especially too. But morning session is best for me. The market just tends to, for whatever reason, personality or whatever the, the case is, uh, just is a, this is a trend day from the 18th of uh, December. And you can see that the biggest moves were off the open. Well, not, not the I don't trade. I don't trade gaps anymore. But I'll trade the first, after the first, say, 30 minutes or hour, I'll enter my first trade that uh, is based on what I expect to happen or maybe day structure. And the market, just for whatever strategies I use, tends to work best in the first couple of hours. It tends to get kind of dead in the uh, lunchtime. And I take breaks, go outside, do some, get some air or something. And then I, I, I make sure I'm back for my time central. One o'clock, you sometimes get a breakout uh, that we call the one o'clock break. I think some people call it one o'clock shakeout or something like that. But the one o'clock central, I guess two eastern. You want to pay attention if there's a breakout. Um, those are my favorites. First couple, two to two hours, two and a half hours, and the one o'clock uh, breakout. Is okay, I see. I see several questions um, about the indicator. So first, let me ask. Uh, you're using a twenty and a fifty EMA, I think. Is there anything special about the twenty or fifty, or could it be, uh, you know? Uh, some other numbers, 34 and 55 or 34 and 100, et cetera. And then the second part of the question is I see a lot of people asking me about the divergence side. So and, and your panel, too, you're using the tick, uh, market internals, the breadth tick. Is there some other, um, is something special about tick? Why do you like tick? What about using RSI? What about using MACD or some other form of divergence? Do you place more emphasis on one over another? Yeah, yeah, good question. Thanks. Um, yeah, very good question. For me, let's start with the moving averages and move to internals. Then, no, there's nothing special about them. But what is special is having a short term and an intermediate term, because just with one moving average, it's not going to give you the whole picture. We look at trend and we quantify. This is just basic uh, Dow theory by higher a sequence of higher highs and higher lows. That determines a trend. Um, but you can also use moving averages, specifically a combination of two. For me, it's a 2050. For whatever reason, when I first I, I came into technical analysis in about 2003, uh, from I guess really investing in, in uh, 98, 90, late 97, 98, and uh, that's I guess I used to come to StockCharts.com with John Murphy, and they use that, so I'm stuck with it. So uh, nothing wrong with any kind of permutation. Uh, simple use Fibonacci, they use 21, 35. Nothing wrong, 55, whatever. Nothing wrong with that at all. But the, I think for me, the main idea is having a short term uh, to kind of contain the trends. It even pull back fully, but it's just the market's going to pull back to something and then continue the trend. A short term average should contain a strong trend. Uh, an intermediate average, in this case, the 50, maybe the 55, a Fibonacci number, uh, would contain the intermediate level. So uh, it, it's trend continuity, trend re recognition. And so that's you know what I use there, but no, nothing special about it. It's okay. just I found it works better. And about the internals, I'm huge on internals uh, because it's not based on price. Not a big fan of volume to be honest, but internal specifically breadth, uh, which is your advanced decline, and uh, issues that are positive on the session minus those that are negative. And uh, even more than that is tick. And, and the reason is tick is I call it like a democracy. Um, if you think of the S&P, there's 500 issues, or stocks in this case, but uh, and each one has one vote in the tick. So if 400 stocks are ticking, or that's a lot, but say 400 are positive, sorry, the ticking, they, 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 the last last uh, iteration was a high, it was a movement up, you know, plus one, a penny or something, uh, minus, and say 100 are, quote, ticking down. So 100 stocks made a uh, tick lower. That's a tick of 300 because it's 400 minus so one, and so that gives me a sense of market participation of the entire index, because Apple and Intel and a few other you know Exxon Mobil 
uh, big names weight the index. So if you have an index, Dow, NAS, Russell for that matter, making a new intraday high, but the majority of stocks are lower or actually not making that high, that's very important because I'm not going to be buying the retracements uh, that occur in that divergent situation versus like this on a trend day where you have price making new highs, tick making new highs, maybe breadth making new highs. That just shows me that there's a democracy. The market's moving up and it's moving up with a, a lot of stocks and that should lead to continuation versus like this where the market itself, the index of the futures in this case, is moving lower but the tick is moving higher on a relative basis. That tells me that not all stocks are pushing lower, and in fact some, if not most at some point, are starting to have to catch some bids, catch some buys. And of course, even more so is a kickoff. But um, that's kind of Wyckoff. It's a, it's a sign of strength that shows that there's a lot of movement into this in the market. It's really not being picked up by the price. So internals from your guides for uh, confirmation suggests continuity divergences, specifically lengthy or multi-swing, would signal um, non-confirmations or forecast reversals. Right. Okay. Uh, Scott wants to know if you have any opinions on using Renko charts. Renko. I haven't. I think I used the, I, I achieved the CMT designation in 2007, <laughs> and I think that's the last time I looked at Renko charts. I don't mean to, I, I, positive or negative, I don't know. Um, I, I have not used them. I studied them, and they just really jump out at me. Um, so personally, again, if, if they work for you, fine. I'm, I'm not criticizing at all. I just I don't have the experience with them. Uh, Prescott wants to know, do you typically not place trades during the first hour and you're waiting to see if it's a range or a trend day? Yes. Uh, for me, per, again, this is a personal question, but yes. I used to be a big gap fader, and that worked out well. I used to keep stats on the blog, and I sometimes do now even. But uh, gap fading for me worked a lot better in 2007, 2008. It just, for whatever reason, middle of 2008 and nine wasn't working as well for me personally. Uh, trend days were working better. The market was, keep in mind, the volatility was very high in 2008, uh, and, and there were more trend days in general. So um, gaps didn't really fill. It, it, as a percentage of, say, 2007, that was a little more, um, you know, more friendly to fills. And maybe it's better now, but for, for whatever reason, I've switched and really don't play gaps. Gaps, to me, are an indication of impulse or supply demand imbalance that will, there's signals or not opportunities for me. Uh, a large gap that's not filled should tell me to play retracements for trend continuity. A small gap that is filled tells me probably I should play retra uh, fades in terms of a range day and I, I don't play the gap. It's, it's information, just like an indicator. I'm not right. going to, you know, is it going to fill, is it not? Um, there's a lot of people who do a lot of work with gaps, but uh, it's it's it doesn't work for me at this point. Maybe if I start getting more, but it's it's a signal indicator for me as opposed to a uh, opportunity to put on or you know, take on right. a trade or something. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here from Vance and from Thomas. Uh, do you use or have you used any type of market profile or volume profile? And also, uh, it sounds like you've studied Wyckoff. Why aren't you using volume on your charts? If so. Yeah, good question. Uh, Linda Ratchke got me involved with the uh, market profile. <laughs> I love the market profile. One of the best books is Dalton's uh, Mind Over Markets. It's not quite a, probably not a, not a popular book, at least in the, in the general sense, the trading community, but it, it was phenomenal uh, to me. He wrote another book, uh, Markets and Profile. I prefer the Mind Over Markets. It's just a little bit better in terms of explaining uh, the terms of day structure. Um, those are market profile concepts. Uh, value. I don't do so much with like value areas and you know those sorts of things, but the concept of excess, which is a spike, uh, non-confirmations, um, you know, looking at those sort of factors. I use concepts of market profile absolutely. Uh, breakouts from expand consolidations, breakouts, impulses, trend days. A trend day is just a movement uh, through open air or. Uh, there's not a whole lot of orders versus, say, a range day that's just a consolidation depression. Those are still market co pro uh, market profile concepts. Um, volume doesn't really help me as much. I, I use relative volume, especially off the open. So I have a little Excel spreadsheet that, that kind of crunches the uh, 
volume numbers for the SPY and the ES, we're looking really at the first hour and seeing if there's a significant difference or a visual difference of the last, I use usually 20 days, the last 20, which is a month basically, um, of uh, SPY or ES volume. And then we just want to look at is it a trend day or not. A uh, range day would have close or volume that's in line with uh, the 20 day average. Trend days would visually it jumps off at you that says, hey, this volume's higher than normal. So for me, volume is important for determining day structure. I'm, I'm much more on internals than intraday right. volume. Um, okay. We've seen so many, just real quick, we've seen so many volume divergences. Gosh, you know, if you look at, uh, this is a bigger picture concept too, um, which had a lot of charts, but just imagine with me, I mean, you've seen them, uh, the daily charts, you know, volume is at a three or four year low. Uh, it's ridiculous, but it, that will be telling you the market's going to collapse, it's going to fall off the cliff, and da, da 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 But this has been going on for quite some time. You know, volumes are coming out of the market, and the market's been going higher. So yeah, maybe one day it's going to fall apart, but <laughs> that's what the classical interpretation would say, but... Uh, Reality is that it's not done so yet. So I think volume has been a little bit misleading. So uh, for me, again, just sure, for me. Sure. Okay, Roy wants to know, and I'm going to expand on this a little bit, Roy. Uh, do you ever plot a 24-hour Globex chart versus just the, the RTH chart? And do you use uh, the highs and lows off of a cash chart versus looking at, like, the Globex overnight high and low? Yeah, good question. Um, for me, I'm much more on the daily chart, so the planning – the planning is going to be off of the daily. So I'm looking at the ES daily, specifically the um, S&P itself, the actual index. And now you can tell probably <laughs> I'm an index or ES uh, S&P person almost exclusive. I do look in a market a lot of times for trading intraday. I'm going to focus on the ES and the S&P 500. So for intraday strategy planning, based on that, but as I come into the market first thing in the morning, yeah, I'm definitely going to look at what happened overnight. Any kind of major event, any kind of major action, uh, key levels will be noted. I keep them in a little journal I note down, but uh, I, I tend to focus more on the daily chart. Reason being is because those are levels that will, uh, again, it's kind of self-fulfilling. What I'm looking at for technical analysis is not this magical, you know, solution to give you the, the future. That's not what technical analysis is, not, not to me at least. It's uh, probabilities. It's telling me what helped me so much from the CMT, from the Market Technician Association, that, that program was telling me so many strategies from Elliott to Fibonacci to uh, you know indicators, moving averages, you know, MACD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just showed me how many different traders there are that focus on so many strategies. And so I'm just looking at key levels that they're all going to align at. So if there's a you know an Elliott third wave high or something that aligns with a uh, or a, say, say a pullback lower, say an Elliott second wave uh, with a Fibonacci level and a moving average, well any one of those factors is going to drive people to make trading decisions. If you get three of them, boom, there you go. And it doesn't tell you, you know, say you have a support level, it's an Elliott Wave 2 pulling back to a Fibonacci trend line, whatever. Um, people think it's going to rally, so they'll put orders on expecting to rally. So if it happens that way, it's just kind of game planning again, we'll be buyers and, and trade that upward, won't even almost say, uh, uh, what's the word, um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, but if it goes down and breaks under that level, the Elliott people are going to stop out, the Fibonacci people are going to stop out. The there's going to be a whole flood of orders in the market that's going to be coming out, and I'm going to trade that too. I won't expect that to happen, but if it does, I'm not going to, um, you know, say, well, the chart told me it's going to go up because it was an Elliott second wave and there was a divergence. Well, right, you're, you're going to lose money if the market falls. So right. that, that's, I'm using technical analysis as a uh, as a probabilistic thing that tells me what people are are expecting, where they're putting entry orders in, and more importantly, probably where they're going to panic out. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, let's move on to the uh, the book giveaway. Uh, several people have asked this question, and uh, basically, it's can you talk about your stop strategy, like uh, how many ticks away, uh, are you using an ATR? or using any type of a trailing stop, uh, et cetera? Yeah. Well, each trade is a little bit different. Uh, that's why I didn't talk about stops, because stops is a <laughs> you give two or three presentations on stops. Uh, retracement trades typically, and I focus on those mostly. If you're executing into, let's say, go to the chart here, executing, 
I mentioned in, whoops, into a moving average or, there we go. If you're executing a retracement trade into an inflection point, let's say maybe it's a Fibonacci level, specifically here it's the moving averages, 20 and the 50. Uh, your stop should be based under that. It can be one ATR under, that helps because that's a factor of volatility. And it's a good question, where does one place? Uh, two ticks typically is standard. You don't want to go too much beyond that in the S&P because um, you're usually playing for two, three, four, maybe five ticks. So you're playing, you don't have to, well I, I don't have to have an exact uh, two, three, four factor multiplier. Otherwise I'm risking two points and playing for eight. Sometimes I'll play risk two to play for three. That sounds terrible, but that's, you know, I'm just the way that I sometimes do that. But some people do well with uh, ATRs, placing specifically one ATR, 1 1.5, and maybe two ATRs, which is an indicator you can put in the charts, um, under your entry or under the moving average. But um, it's based on technical analysis because I'm creating a thesis. I'm not just playing random, you know, two ticks away or, or whatever. Because if the market's going to hit that key level and inflect up off of it, meaning buyers are going to come in and sellers are going to take their profits and stop stop selling, um, you know, the shorts are going to cover with a profit, and the upward break will trigger additional buy orders. See, I'm looking for something to happen. A breakout should lead to impulse. Uh, a retracement should lead to this. It should not lead to a bar above it that just slams right back under the moving average or breaks the low. So for me, um, I have a little bit of a fixed distance. So I don't play. I've, I've had trouble playing stops too closely. That's just my conservative nature. I don't want to risk a whole lot, but you can get sort of cut, sort of cut up that way. Um, having the right idea, but being nickled out of your position at the last minute, uh, that <laughs> frequently happens on the futures. Um, so give yourself a little bit of room, but place your stops based on a technical analysis expectation. Trend, a little bit under a trend line, Fibonacci, moving average, or in the case of a breakout, or let's go back to a uh, range, let's say, <clears throat> a range day above the Bollinger. So it shouldn't go beyond the Bollinger. But, it, but even the case of this, let's talk about this real quick, uh, 14.11.50, if you short sold and just nailed that Bollinger there, you put it one tick above it, 14.12, uh, boom, it got you. And you were exactly correct because the market went down and made uh, a test of the Bollinger and got a profitable trade. So give you know, at least above the prior high, above the Bollinger, but not at the Bollinger. So give it some room and base it, I would argue, on technical analysis. Okay, thanks, Corey. And so before we move to the uh, the book giveaway, uh, do you have a slide for contact information? So if anybody has any other questions that we didn't get answered, they can maybe email you or something? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm just directly at Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, at afraidthetrade.com. And, of course, the blog, blog that afraid to trade .com. Um Just email me here, and I'll be able to answer any kind of questions. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, guys. So if, uh, if your questions uh, did not get answered today, then there you go. You can reach Corey right there, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so at this time, I want to go ahead and move to the five-book giveaway. And uh, I think, Corey, you've got the, the questions, and you're going to help me with the answers. So uh, if you can expand the the, the questions panel and go to webinar so you can see all these as they fly by. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, a lot. I didn't see, yeah, I saw the questions here. Damn, my goodness. <laughs> a lot of questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm ready. I got the, yeah, I can see it now. Okay. Do uh, you want to switch to that slide or do you want me to read it? Yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll make it official. I'll let you read the question and we'll... I try to make it as just before we start. I try to make it as specific as possible, like one or two words. But um, closest is it the first one to, to answering will be the correct yeah. answer, correct? So, so we okay. have five books, right? So for question one, it's the first person that answers correctly. Once we get to question three, I'm looking for the third person that answered correctly. And once we get to question five, looking for the fifth person to answer correctly. So it's kind of like you know on the radio, you know, looking for the 97th caller or whatever. That way we give everybody a chance, you know, no matter how fast or slow they can type, uh, they have a chance to, to win. Uh, okay, very good, very good. So Corey, I, I think you might have changed some of the questions since you last emailed them to me. So yeah. if you want to just put it on the screen, then I'll read it out. Okay, well, here we go. We'll click to the first uh, question here. We get it. There we go. All right, go ahead, Mike. 
All right, when uh, assessing the type of day structure, what did I say was the number one rule for detection? Number one rule for detection. No, it's not, not, not a gap, not, well, sort of, not determine the trend. It's what I said, what I said. Ah, gotcha. Prescott looks at the first and they got it. Uh, okay. Assume it's a range day, correct? The first, and that's, that's debatable, but the assume, be a scientist, assume it's a range day. Otherwise, if you think every day is a trend day, it, it's not. You'll, you'll make mistakes. So. Okay. So, Prescott, Prescott I, need your, I need your BMT username, please, and I'll, I'm going to contact you after we get through here uh, for more info. So, Prescott, so the answer was assume it's a range day. And, okay, there's his username. Let me write that down. Okay, question two. Number two, good luck. Name two of the three indicators I said work best for taking trades during a range day. And so we're looking for the second person. Looks like se correctly. second person. Sal got it correct, So, but he's the first one, looks like. Okay. Bollinger Bands MA. Not the MA. Bollinger Bands MA. Sharon Lee looks like. Sharon Lee may have got it. Okay, uh, so guys, yeah, did you it's stop? two. It's two. Bollinger Band and divergence. Yeah, right. two. And uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, Sal got it first, but it looks like Sharon got two there because everybody okay. else used one. So yeah, Sharon. All right. So Sharon Lee, I need your BMT username. And so the answer is Bollinger Bands and divergence. Mm -hmm. And a, and a reversal candle. Yeah. And Sharon. So okay, there we go. Let me write that down. Okay. So let's go All to right. question three. Looking for the Good third. Luck. Third person answer. Third person. Here we go. What is one strategy or trade we should never use on a confirmed trend day? Uh oh, jump my jump my Oh, head sorry. Head. Did I yeah, get what, yeah. What is? Oh my goodness. Oh, jump ahead. What is one strategy or trade that we should never use on a trend day? Okay. Oh, this everybody got so this. We're looking for the D third person. Looks at like D Almonte. Right. So D Almonte, I need your BMT username, please. So the answer is fade. Yeah, fade reversal. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so oh, let me write God. that down. Okay, so now we're going to look for the fourth correct answer here on question four. All right, ready? Question four. Name two of the three signals that often precede a rounded reversal failed trend day. Two so we're looking three for three signals. Right. Reversal. So we're looking for two two part answer fourth person that has it right. So there's a little strategy involved on how fast you answer. <laughs> oh, sneaky, 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 sneaky. All right, so two of the three signals that precede a rounded reversal. All right, so I see two. Diverge is a kickoff, so John got the first one. Kickoff and diverge at CS. Diver well, no, I'm not right. Diverge is in higher tech. Yeah, this is tough. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, Eugene, so the first one will be a tick kickoff, it looks like Brian Tully may have got this one. Let me double check that though, because uh, John said, uh, a tick divergence, Wayne, is just one, so um, that's, that's just one. MA, uh, we don't look for that so much, it's a divergence and kickoff, uh, John, kickoff and divergence, CS, divergence and range is not correct, uh, uh, divergence and higher tick, Eugene, and tick kickoff and divergence is Brian, so that's Brian Tully, correct? What, yeah, math is right on that. <laughs> yeah, Brian no, I, that I checked. Yeah, so Brian, uh, needs your BMT username, please. Let's type that in. Okay, you can write that down. Okay, and now for the fifth and final, looking for the fifth person that answers this right. All right, this is going to be a little bit more than just one word. So um, I think maybe. All right, here we go. Okay. Question five. Name five. one specific thing that a conservative trader would do differently than an aggressive trader when playing a retracement trade. One thing a conservative trader would do better or differently than a aggressive. So we'll take Wade is going to be correct. Uh, looks like we right, wait so for confirmation. We're... Brad, okay. John is going to be wait, 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 wait. All right, guys. So let's stop. say Andrew Craig. Stop typing. Andrew Craig, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Flying <laughs> off Andrew my Craig, Everybody got this one. Yeah. One, two, um, three, four. Let's see. Is it Andrew? One, two, three, four, five. Yep. So Andrew, Andrew Craig. Craig. Need your B into username. So the right answer was wait for confirmation. Andrew, mm -hmm. need your username we're waiting for that all right guys so uh, congratulations to the five winners uh, and I'm gonna send you a private message on BMT once we get through here Andrew I'm still waiting for your your BMT username all right there it is
All right, guys. So congratulations. I'll get in touch with you afterwards. We'll get the books to you in the next, uh, you know, week or two. Uh, so, uh, Corey, if you want to throw the contact slide up again. So if anybody has any more questions for Corey or if they're interested in signing up to your blog or your services, then you can reach them right there. The info is right there on the screen. All right, guys. Uh, well, thank you very much, Corey. I appreciate you being here. I look forward to having you back again uh, sometime in the future. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bob, from uh, Near Future. So, well, thank you all, everybody, for attending, and uh, have a great time in the market. Be safe. Yeah, thanks, guys, and I'll post this recording on BMT sometime tomorrow.